Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming on St. Patrick's Day weekend. My name, for those of you who may not have been here before, I'm Paula Penchenko, and I'm really delighted to welcome you here tonight. Um, the Tandem Press and the Jazz Studies Program at the Mead Witter School of Music at the University of Wisconsin are absolutely delighted to present uh, the Tandem Press Friday Jazz Series. And we're also delighted to welcome you, um, our audience here, and those of you who are listening to us live on the web. This series is made possible with the incredible support of the Friends of Tandem Press, and the live streaming is brought to you by Noah Gilfin and Megan Gilfin from Audio for the Arts, and David Alcorn from Metronome. The program could not have happened without the incredible support of the Friends of Tandem Press. And Johannes Wallman, the John and Carolyn Peterson Chair in Jazz Studies, and his colleagues, Peter Dominguez, um, Chad McCullough, Nick Moran, Chris Rottmeyer, and Les Thimmick. I also want to, con to thank the incredible music students here behind me and those in the second half who will be playing tonight. The program will feature um, the Blue Note Ensemble, directed by Johannes Wallman, and the second half will be the Afro-Cuban Jazz Ensemble, directed by Nick Moran. The wines tonight have been most generously provided by Gay and Tracy, Gay, Tracy Will and Gay Strandemo, and who have attended over 50 concerts in this series. During the intermission, we hope that you will view our latest exhibition entitled Pastures of Plenty, which is the MFA exhibition by our graduate student who has been here all year, David Love, and he will undertake his final exam next week. His parents are here tonight, his aunt is here tonight, there may be other people here tonight, but next week he will do his final oral exam and we all wish him every success. He is completely amazing and I think you will enjoy the show. Please also feel uh, free to stroll through the studio and see the prints in progress. And for those of you, you at home, there will be a short piece discussing the background to David's fantastic exhibition. Welcome and thank you all. Over to the students and Johannes. Thank you, Paula. Um, I normally don't talk before we start the set, but um, I just wanted to uh, sort of uh, create give you the setting of what we're about to do. If you have heard the Blue Note Ensemble before, you know that every semester we focus on the uh, music of one 1950s or 1960s era recording artist. And um, uh, this semester, the focus is on the music of Charles Mingus, the you know, great bassist and composer. Uh, if you are a, uh, yeah, a, a jazz fan, then Charles Mingus needs no introduction. If you're not, I'm just gonna sort of say that um, uh, you know, for the people who um, may come up, if, if, you, if you were to come up with a list of maybe the fi you know, five greatest jazz composers in, in history, most people would probably have Charles Mingus on that list, and you'll hear why. Um, so everything that uh, this group is gonna be playing for the next hour is uh, music by bassist composer Charles Mingus, and we're going to start with the piece, not by Charles Mingus, entitled uh, The Call, but it's part of the uh, program because he, um, because Charles Mingus recorded this with um, his quintet um, fairly late in his life in 1973 on an album called Mingus Moves and, uh, and it very much fits the, uh, you know, the other material in there. This was written by Ronald Hampton, the, uh, the trumpet player in the group. Everything after that is in fact by Charles Mingus. The second, the second piece is entitled Duke Ellington's Sound of Love and it's uh, a Mingus's tribute to one of his great loves and influences. Uh, as a composer and uh, an artist, you know, the great Duke Ellington. So, um, and after those two tunes, I'll you know, talk about what's next. So this is The Call.
Hey, let me uh, take a moment and introduce the band. On uh, alto saxophone, it's uh, John Kruger. <laughs> Jack Oley on the trombone. <laughs> Jack Johnson on piano. <laughs> Michael Plumridge on drums. <laughs> and then the role of Charles Mingus on the bass, Nathan Pedraza. Uh, now Charles Mingus was always, um, it always kept the blues very much at the roots of, uh, at, you know, at the core of his compositions, and then uh, and both of the next two pieces um, are very much blues influenced. Um, the first one is entitled "Blue Sea," and it's from a 1957 recording uh, entitled the Cl called "The Clown," and then from his uh, Mingus's classic album "Mingus Aum," uh, the piece after uh, "Blue Sea" is uh, has the wonderful title. Better get hit in your soul.
Better Get Hit In Your Soul, Charles Mingus. And of course, we're con continuing. If you're joining us uh, late, we're, we're doing an all Mingus set uh, with this band. Um, the next two pieces are um, first another homage to another favorite uh, musician and a big influence on Charles Mingus, the great Thelonious Monk. And this piece is called Jump Monk. And then the piece after that will be uh, Nostalgia in Times Square. Uh, Jump Monk was recorded in 1955 on Mingus' album. Mingus at the Bohemia was a live recording. And then from 1959, Mingus in Wonderland is not Nostalgia in Times Square. Thank you. 
All right, this group is going to play one more piece, and then uh, we're going to take a, uh, a break, and, uh, and Paula Pachenko is going to um, in talk a little bit about, uh, about Tandem, and uh, there'll be things to do, and the tour, and uh, video, and so on. Uh, but we got one more piece, um, and then after the break, uh, the Afro-Cuban Jazz Ensemble will play a uh, set of, well, Afro-Cuban Jazz. Um, and, uh, uh, we're going to look at this piece as a little bit of a transition because this is a uh, piece uh, where Charles Mingus includes um, some Afro-Cuban rhythmic influences as well. This is entitled Opus 4, and it's a piece that he wrote for his 1973 album, Mingus Moves, which is actually what the first uh, tune of uh, this set was from as well. Uh, the Bluner Ensemble, again, that's uh, Jack Johnson on, uh, on keys, Nathan Pedraza on bass, Michael Plumridge on drums, Jack Oley on trombone and John Kruger on alto saxophone.
wasn't that completely extraordinary. Uh, what a first half. Everybody downstairs who didn't, wasn't able to get seated here today, um, I'm very sorry about that, but um, they were all able to hear because we do have speakers downstairs and they were all really excited about the music, even though they couldn't see you. So following what Johannes said, and um, Johannes uh, is really the person who enabled this program to happen. He was so enthusiastic about the idea. And um, the thing that I want to say is we can all go downstairs. There's room in the gallery uh, for, you know, uh, to look around at David Love's exhibition. And then the other thing is you can walk through the studio and see some of the things that are in progress. And um, we'll be exhibiting in Chicago in April. And so we're doing a lot of preparation for that. But I'm happy to answer any questions. And so is our staff. And um, that would be terrific. But again, I just have to say, let's raise a hand for these gentlemen. It's intermission for the Tandem Press Jazz Concert, and uh, we always are excited to show you new artwork and introduce you to new artists. And I have uh, an artist here who is new, at least to this space, David Love, and also the director of Tandem Press, Paula Panchenko. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Paula, before I start asking David questions, let's make him uncomfortable by having <laughs> you um, talk, uh, tell us who, who he is and uh, give us a little bit of a, an introduction, since you know him better than I at this point. I do indeed. So um, David is a graduate student in the MFA program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, mm -hmm. and we are... Um, uh, a part, we are part of the university, we are um, a part of the School of Education, and we are affiliated to the Department of Art. So throughout the years of Tandem Press, we have had wonderful graduate students working here. Um, our Dean Diana Hess decided three years ago that graduate students should be paid properly if they have internships. And she raised a lot of money um, uh, so that mo all of the graduate students are fully funded. So in that, uh, I'll explain what fully funded means in a moment. But essentially, she then said, if people could go to their own um, donors and request funding and match it, she would match it right up to that amount. Terrific. So we have um, a wonderful advisory board, and we had two donors, Ken and Colleen Stotts, and Gabriel Haberland and her husband, Will Willie Haberly, and they immediately stepped up and matched the amount, and we were indebted to them for doing this. So the first year that David came, which was three years ago, and he's about to um, open his MFA exhibition um, uh, tonight, and we're all really excited about that. And he will then have his, his MFA um, um, uh, oral exam um, with his professors next week. Ah. So we're all very excited about that too. David came to Tandem and said, um, three years ago, I want to work at Tandem Press. And we said, well, you know, we have our two students. It doesn't matter. I want to work at Tandem Press. <laughs> and we said, well, actually, we, last year we had to pick the student. I want to work at Tandem Press. And so David has continued to work here. And the first two years, he did not have a 50% salary. He did not have tuition remission from us, from Tandem, and benefits, and so on and so forth. But we said to uh, our colleagues, we want him next year. And they said to me, everyone wants David, Paula. Oh. And I said, 
uh-oh, what am I going to do about this? So, okay, I said, this year, you're, I'm not letting you off the hook. And they said, okay. David has been an extraordinary student, and he is incredibly talented. And the artists who have come in here all love him, and they think he's terrific, which he is. And he can do anything. He, he is excellent at printmaking, and he will explain to you when you talk to him about this particular show. He has done so many different technique, printmaking techniques in this particular show, which is one thing. And he's also a sculptor, and he's an installation artist, and he's really smart, and he's a brilliant printmaker. Hmm. So... We will. I told you this would be embarrassing for you. <laughs> Doing okay. I'm, I'm sufficiently flattered. Thank you, we, Paul. We we will miss this man enormously. Uh, terrific. But we know he's going to go very far, and then we will be the people saying, "David, could you do this for us? Would you be able to talk to this person?" I know that's going to happen in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, David, yeah, it's, it's terrific. It's nice to meet you, first of all. And yeah, and thanks for the conversation and for the art. And I, I really love this kind of stuff because it's as cool as it is when someone creates something from nothing, like takes, takes paint, makes a print, makes sculpture, whatever it is. I think uh, it's, it's, it's a whole different level when one is able to take pieces that have been created for one purpose and then and then repurpose them as art. Um, so tell me about where that inspiration came from for you. Yeah, um, I think early on I just always liked collecting things mm -hmm. and um, growing up in a post-industrial city, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and just the, the evidence of steel manufacturing and um, other types of manufacturing was just very evident and clear that like once this place like made stuff regularly like a lot of stuff for mm -hmm. the world and I was like really interested in that notion because all the mills had closed down by the time I was you know able to think about these things so I became really interested in like the vernacular language of utilitarian objects um, tools and like surfaces and um, just general industrial aesthetics, I think. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really understand why or how that could be relevant to my art making. I was just more into drawing at first. Mm -hmm. And I found that printmaking was that in between because it had sort of an industrial um, history attached to it mm -hmm. because it was an industry in itself. Um, so through thinking about presses and machinery and vocation and labor, I was able to tie in my interests in industry and also art together. And um, through that world, I've been able to expand on that theme in many different ways. Uh, yeah. With the objects, and I know you have prints here and you have the, the found objects. Mm -hmm. And did, did you find these, first of all, like just lying around places? Did you buy them at, at flea markets? Did you, how did you accumulate these things? There's a combination of things going on. I, I guess I'm reluctant to admit that I dumpster dive, but I occasionally pick stuff up off the street okay. and just deal with the funny looks, okay. essentially, <laughs> from, from people. But No loss of respect yeah, for I dumpster mean, it's diving, just, you know? Yeah, I'll it's, just be carrying around, for example, like a, like a length of steel or some like yeah. weird pipe that I found just because it had a cool like patina or wear to it or the mm -hmm. material was interesting. Okay. Um, but we other don't times, have to pay some price for our art and that's, that's yours. That's it's one the, of dealing them. Dealing with the odor of... <laughs> yeah. And the other one is I, I do frequent flea markets and okay. I've found that in Wisconsin in particular, flea markets that are associated with the agricultural industry are very interesting because mm -hmm. they have tractor parts, they have tools, they have um, old like trailer hitches for mules and horses. I have some of that on this wall behind me. Um, yeah, it's just the, the, the material culture really, really called to me in that way here. Um, so I was able to start collecting in that way. Terrific. Are you drawn to an object more for its appearance or for its intended function? Or is it a combination of both? Because I could imagine either one being something that would draw you to a, to a piece. I think it's a combination, um, but I think what happens first is I like try to deduct what the object was used for. So mm -hmm. if it is a tool, I'm like, okay, I'm drawn to this because it's a tool and has this utilitarian sort of history to it. 
But then once I bring it back to the studio, I start to analyze it visually as if it's um, an art object. Okay. So appreciating it for its form, color, texture, that kind of thing. Okay, terrific. I, we're, I want to talk about the, the biggest object in the room, the, mm-hmm. the, the shed, in a minute. But first of all, these pieces behind us, which you know anybody watching this video is going to go, oh, I wonder what's going on with these pieces behind us. So can you g- give me a little bit of an understanding of the, the prints you've got You've got object, print, three objects, print, three objects, print. It, what, what, is the, what is the relationship between them and, and what, what is the overall vision? Yeah, so what we were talking about earlier about like appreciating objects for their form, that's kind of how I approach this wall. Um, but in f- firstly, the prints were made and those were made from ar- like studying archival images and mm. photographs on um, various platforms such as the Wisconsin Historical Society and the Library of Congress. And they're images depicting different industries. Mm. So we have an agricultural scene of a harvester. We have a slag heap, which is um, basically a byproduct of the steel making process in the center. And then over here is um, an iron. That's this This is the slag heap. Okay. And they're- uh, Yeah, tell, yeah. So tell me about that. Because so, it look, it's, you know what's cool about it is that it looks, it looks to me like distorted human shadows. I mean, that's essentially what industries do to the landscape is it becomes sort of an abstracted altering of the landscape. Once heavy right. industries and extractive industries are brought in to an area, it really changes the landscape. And right. I think that's what I'm trying to depict in these without being too overly descriptive. Okay. It's, they're slightly abstracted and slightly faded yeah. to think about memory and loss and uh, changing of, of time and landscape. Yeah. Um, so what... Originally, what um, this was was like a train car would pull up to a hill, hillside, mm-hmm. and it would have several like torpedo shaped um, cars full of molten slag, okay. and they just dump it over the hillside. Okay, and, and was, the slag being the part, the the the, the waste of the, the waste steel. product of yeah. steel making. Okay. that's correct, and it's yeah. molten metal being poured over a hillside essentially, wow. and. A lot of areas in Pittsburgh, wow. Pennsylvania in particular, are built this way. And that's that's, that is, yeah, that is terrific. And yeah, I love how you've, you, you've told that story in a subtle way. <laughs> and uh, you're not hitting us over the head with it. But yeah, it's, it's, a, yeah, it's it just beautiful shapes. And are the tools surrounding it and above and below it, are there, is there a specific relationship? Or is it, is it all just... just part of the the whole visual experience specific relationships no i think they're more tangential in that um, i chose material based on like the material the object relates to the image in a more abstract and subtle way so for example this ruler is made of stainless steel right so that like word association like iron steel slag Ah, and then over here i have stuff that's more made of wood so i have like the the wooden yoke and then the wooden kind of other thing that's part of the yoke harness, and then the scraper, and then the old iron thing, and like maybe mm-hmm. a more domestic tool to relate to the farm. And then on the other side, I have more iron-based, industry-based things. Okay, yeah. What, by the way, what is this? I have no, I have no clue. Okay. But I like it. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it, it's, it's, it, I, yeah, I'm trying to figure out, is it something that's meant to let one vehicle pull something else or is it uh, you know is it a, a, an instrument of torture what <laughs> yeah I <don't>. I, so <laughs> it, as being part of the university I, I took um, some courses in the material culture mm-hmm. uh, department or area I suppose in the school of human ecology and um, I learned how to deduct things and like okay. research objects just based on their appearance like thinking about history mm-hmm. and anthropo- anthrop- um, anthropology mm-hmm. and archaeology so I, th- I can deduct that the bottom piece is some sort of a stake for like like a tent stake holding yeah, something in the ground, yeah. and the top is some sort of a clip for. Okay. I don't wow. know. I don't know what. Very yeah. okay. Very. <laughs> it's, whatever it is, it's very cool. Thank you. Now let's talk about the the shed, and uh, this is it's the it's the dominating piece of the room, and it's just got so much character it's got uh it's it's got a lot going on and i don't even know what specifically to ask you i'm just gonna say tell us about the shed yeah so it was an idea that came about when i was 
at a flea market kind of thing, and I saw there was piles of material, just raw material laying around. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to the vendor, and they said that these steel panels came from a barn in central Wisconsin. That's all I knew. Mm. Um, but it made me think of a storage shed yeah. immediately. And um, so I like made these mock-ups in the studio. Like, well, first of all, I bought all this steel, and I was like, what am I doing with my life, essentially? <laughs> and, and then I was like, okay, I can build something out of it, and it can be a really important part or like a grounding part of the thesis. Mm -hmm. And so how I went about constructing the, the, the shed was that it would first serve as like a context or like a ground for the mm. exhibition. So the objects could have come from the shed or the shed is a metaphor wow. for what gets left behind from cultures of industry and labor um, right. in oh, various communities. That's, that's a terrific point. I'm glad you said that because I didn't think about that aspect of it. But yes, all the objects we see on these walls could have been stored in such a structure. Um, so it all it all relates. That's absolutely awesome. So um, I'm talking to David Love. He His uh, exhibition here at Tandem Press is called Pastures and Plenty. Pastures of Plenty. Of Plenty, sorry, yeah, Pastures is, of Plenty. Yeah. And uh, it, there's some just absolutely you know fascinating pieces. So I'm hoping that you will all have a chance to take a look at it. And before we close out, the last thing I wanna ask you is, what haven't I asked you that you wish I had? Is there, is there something you'd like to say about the pieces or the process and I just haven't asked the right question? Um, no, I think, I think I'll touch on the title because I think it's kind of an interesting yeah. story. Pastures of Plenty is a reference to a folk song by Woody Guthrie. Okay. And it's sort of about how I perceive the song is it's about working hard and mm -hmm. essentially not seeing a return. Not seeing, not not reaping the benefit of a hard work of your hard work, okay. and I'm sort of using that as a as a basis for this exploration of myth and prosperity and American mm. labor um, okay. throughout the exhibition wow. and in all the work. Okay, terrific. Yeah, I mean Woody Guthrie is has there's there's so much amazing, uh, uh, so many amazing aspects to his story. Like even his his guitar that had this machine kills fascists painted on it is like yeah what a what an amazing guy um terrific um so paula thank you for introducing us to david love and for uh, this this putting up this wonderful exhibition and for the jazz concerts to which we are about to return david love so nice to meet you and thank you very much for uh, for these works thank you i appreciate your questions and i'm very grateful for this opportunity thank terrific. you david yeah. thank you now back to tandem press jazz People of Tandem Press, how are we feeling so far? We're still having fun? Yeah? While you're in the clapping mood, can we have one more round of applause for the UW Blue Note Ensemble? They sounded great. And being a bassist, they get extra credit for playing Mingus because uh, he's an amazing artist and we should be playing him more. Um, it is my pleasure to present the UW Afro-Cuban Jazz Ensemble. Um, this is our uh, second concert of this spring semester, and we have uh, five tunes for you. Um, these are all tunes that we are we're working on our Latin jazz chops for this this unit. And uh, even though that, you know we're concentrating on improvisation, uh, this is Afro-Cuban music, uh, which means that it's danceable. Um, and so we highly encourage dancing. In fact, it is our goal. Um, their grades depend on whether we can get you dancing or not. Um, yeah, so it's a group effort here. And uh, <laughs> so we're going to start with a composition um, written by the great Chucho Valdez, the piano player, composer. Um, he is celebrating the 50th anniversary of his seminal Cuban group, Iraquere. They're on tour right now uh, with um, Arturo Sandoval and Paquito de Riviera. They have reunited to, um, to uh, reimagine the music that they made popular in the 70s that really changed the game. Um, so this is one of his compositions from around that era. This is a tune entitled Mambo Influenciado.
All right. Um, periodically, I'll be introducing the uh, the students. So let's let's start with our our uh, our conguera. Can we give a round of applause for Katie Perkins on the congas? <laughs> on drums, show your love for Scott Lanzaga. <laughs> let's do the whole rhythm section. Why not? On bass, show your love to Shannon Finn. And on keys, show your love to Isaiah Dobbins. <laughs> and uh, we're gonna have to, we're gonna let the horns work for their introduction on this next tune. This is a very horn-heavy song. This is uh, written by the great Rebecca Bouillon, um, who is a piano player and composer in her own right, um, but wrote this tune and, and arranged it for the great Tito Puente in his orchestra. Uh, this is a tune entitled Second Wind. Second 
Let's introduce our horns. They did a great job on that one. On tenor saxophone, show your love for Pratik Tandon. <laughs> on alto saxophone, Will Frizicki. <laughs> and on trumpet, show your love, Will Kelly. Uh, and, and by the way, I'm Nick Moran. I'm, I'm the, I have the pleasure and honor of directing this wonderful ensemble. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we're going to uh, follow that tune by a classic Cuban song. Uh, by the way, speaking of classic Cuban music, did anyone see that wonderful show at the Overture Center with Eladias Ochoa at all two weeks ago? Nobody? Oh, you missed one, a good one. Um, playing some classics. So we're going to, uh, in that spirit, we were actually, as a course, we were welcomed by the Overture Center to go to that show. We got to see a live Cuban band, which we don't get to see every semester, and it was very inspiring. So we're trying to put that same swing into our music that we heard a couple weeks back. Um, so we'll do it with this tune. This is a, um, a, a charanga-type tune, uh, another s Cuban style. This is uh, a tune entitled A Mi Que. And I should note that we actually are going to be singing on this tune, and if you want to help us out with the chorus, the words are very simple. It's A Mi Que. Got it? All right, cool. All right, thank you.
more, show a little more love for Will Brzezicki on the alto. We, we left him out there for a little while. You know, maybe they're dancing downstairs, but you guys aren't dancing over here. And uh, we'll do our best, but again, kidding, not kidding, their grades do depend on it, so help them out. And I think they're playing, they're playing well. Um, all right, so we're gonna, we're gonna slow it down. So if you didn't wanna do an um tempo song, this is your chance for couples dancing or however you'd like to do it. We're going to um, get into the genre of, of Cuban music of bolero. Boleros are our love songs and uh, in different forms of love, love lost, love found, and the other one. Um, and so this, this tune was uh, made very, very popular by the great Benny More, who was one of the, um, the best Cuban singers out there. In fact, he's so good that everyone wants to sound like him still to this day. Um, he's from Cienfuegos, Cuba, which is that port city right underneath the island. And, uh, and there's a statue of him that I got to see, and I never realized that Benny More is about this tall. Um, but his voice, if you hear him on recordings, he sounds like he's eight foot tall. So, uh, um, so we're going to do our best to invoke the great Benny More on this next tune, Como Fue for the couples out there that want to dance. Okay.
Thank you so much for our wonderful dancers back there. Thank you. That was great. It was great. It worked. See? 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 All right. So we have one more tune in this wonderful set. We, again, we want to thank um, uh, Tandem Press for having us here. Um, yeah. And I, I should note, you know, um, the mover and shaker of this, this spot, Paolo Pancheco. Um, is it okay if I, s I mean, okay. Uh, she's retiring, um, and, and it's gonna be a, a, a big loss for, for this, this organization, but also, uh, well, actually, it won't be a loss for the nightlife, because we, we're, we're, we're gonna see her out more and more and more, but uh, I just want wonderful work she does. Thank you. And while we're in the thank you mood, can we have a round of applause for Audio for the Arts and their wonderful work, making us sound even better than we should. <laughs> so we have one more tune. This is a, uh, a Tito Puente tune. Again, one of the not only ambassadors of, of Latin music, but of Latin jazz. And he actually wasn't too uh, keen on that term. Um, but you know, using Afro-Cuban rhythms as a vehicle for improvisation. And that's what we've been doing with this set. So this is a prime example of that. This is a tune entitled Picadillo de la Puente. And uh, with this, we'll leave you. Uh, please dance for this next tune. We can get this whole place around it, you know. Get, yeah, all right, here we go.
One more time for the UW Afro-Cuban Jazz Ensemble. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tandem Press. Thank you so much, Paula. Uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah. Okay. I um, just think that this group of incredible musicians has done an amazing 